the fight. Hey, everybody, this is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. And our special guest today is truly a leader. What an entrepreneur. Mariah McKechnie, the owner and founder of Northland Special Events, which I know very well, Superior Blooms, and The Vault. And we're going to get into a little bit of all those, but Mariah, welcome. Thanks, Tom. I'm excited to be here with you today. Yeah, we're going to have some fun because I, I know about some of your businesses pretty well. And uh, I think our listeners will learn a lot from you. You're a true entrepreneur, but your businesses also are really special and, and really fun. Um, I'm yes. sure at three, three in the morning, they don't seem so fun all the time to <laughs> you, <right. laughs> but, uh, but they certainly are. But let's go all the way back because you know what? You are a bundle of energy and, and, uh, and let's, let's learn about you. Where did you grow up, Mariah? Yeah, so I'm actually in North Dakota. I grew up all over the state of North Dakota, uh, was born in Grand Forks and then uh, headed out west to Williston for a few years during the original oil boom back in the early 80s. Um, my dad was an attorney out there. And then we spent some time in Bismarck and then finally ended up back in Grand Forks. Um, my mom was from Crookston. So my grandparents were in Crookston and, and we decided to, or my parents decided to move the family to Grand Forks um, to be closer to family. Um, and I finished high school there. So I, uh, yeah, no, it's kind of a little known fact about me that I grew up in North Dakota, but uh, left immediately upon graduation and uh, haven't actually spent much time back there since. <laughs> Are you a fighting Sioux fan for all of us hockey fans? Um, my dad would say yes, I definitely am. But uh, to be honest, I just uh, didn't spend much of my days there watching hockey. Uh, but yes, as opposed to any other teams, sure, go Sioux. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I think a lot of us are are, are fans. You know, Bulldogs are out here, but uh, if we had to pick a second, it's probably the Sioux. So, sure. you know, moving around North Dakota, you know, in your dad's career and stuff, what was your childhood like? What what did you enjoy doing? And and obviously you're creative, so there, you had to have yeah. a creative gene as a child as Somewhere well. Somewhere in there. Yeah, so I feel very fortunate to have had a, you know, a Midwestern childhood with very little kind of worry, you know, I was just lots of time outside and just a lot of family time. Um, we were so blessed wherever we live to, you know, have community and, um, and, you know, just my parents and my sister and I were very, very tight knit. Um, and the entrepreneurial part really started later um, when I was in high school. My mom um, started a business and became entrepreneurial. Um, so I got a taste of that. But yeah, I, I also had because my so my father is actually from Massachusetts and ended up in Grand Forks with the Air Force. So I had a tie to other places from the very beginning. And I think that's a really important part of my story is even though I grew up somewhere very isolated geographically. Um, I knew that there was a larger world around me and I was lucky that my parents made sure that I, I got to experience that and really starting with going to visit grandparents and family on the East coast. Um, and they worked really hard to give my sister and I opportunities to travel domestically and internationally. And just to know that like we had options and there were amazing places throughout the world, whether they'd seen them or not, they made sure that we did. And now now I can say I've seen a lot of the world, so have my children and, and my parents. And so I think that's a really important part is a lot of people um, growing up in a more isolated place don't get that chance. And I felt really lucky. Mariah, you had in your hometown a natural disaster mm -hmm. when you were younger. Can you tell us about that? And, and what did you learn for life experiences during something like that? Yeah, so absolutely one of the most pivotal uh, times in my life. I was a senior in high school, uh, 1997, and the Red River that, that runs along the banks or runs through um, Grand Forks and forms the border between North Dakota and Minnesota, you know, typically flooded. There was always a springtime concern around flooding, uh, but that year it was a 500 year flood that uh, had us uh, literally evacuating in the middle of the night and leaving our home and office and everything behind for weeks. Um, it was 
yeah, changed everything to be honest. And like I said, I was a senior, so I literally left in the middle of the night and never went back to my childhood home as it was. Um, didn't really have a graduation prom, all of the normal things. And in fact, I really identified with the, the um, seniors in 2020 in the way that their year was cut short. I was having a lot of memories and emotions around like, oh my gosh, that is very similar to what I went through. Um, and, you know, I left for college. Basically, I left that day in April and I never really went back um, in into the same place. Um, I went to college um, in Vermont and I, I kind of escaped. And I, I, I felt like the lucky one because my family was at home dealing with rebuilding and all of the psychological trauma of a natural disaster and all of that. And I, I kind of flew away and, and it's, it's, it has impacted us as a family forever. You know, my parents had to rebuild a home and my dad's law firm and, um, you know, pay for college and take care of my younger sister. So, you know, that was a really hard time for them. And, uh, I think that, you know, there's many memories that I have, but it made me resilient and to see like that you can come back from something that's really hard, the power of sticking together as a family. Um, yeah. And appreciate my parents and like what they had to go through to keep me, uh, in college and, and thriving away from what they were dealing with. You know, it's interesting because you talk about a natural disaster like you had, and, and it doesn't make the national news like so many of the others do. Yeah, sure, it makes the news, but it seems like a flash in the pan where yeah. we, we live in the Midwest and we hear about all this. And, and you know, so many people don't know about the Red River that actually all the watershed from here flows north to Hudson Bay. Yes. So that, that river's going from the, the border of Minnesota and, and the Dakotas yeah. north up to Hudson Bay through Canada. And you didn't hear about it, but you hear about all the hurricanes and all the things yeah. in the Gulf and, and down south and the, the tornadoes. But these were devastating things that just wiped out communities. Yeah, it was it was really bad. And I, what I didn't mention is we lived across the street from that river. And so, um, you know, we were pretty hard. It was pretty hard hit and participated in all the sandbagging activities and, you know, just like lived through, I can feel it even like the, the anxiety in my chest when, when I hear a backup sound of like a beeping truck, like I immediately go back to that place in time of the sandbagging truck. So, um, there'll always be those little things that stick with you, but at the end of the day, like, to learn resilience at that age and to know that like, it's just going to be one part of the bigger story of my life. I think I feel very lucky for that and have such an appreciation of, of loss and, and, and just how, uh, how things are just things stuff is just stuff. And, you know, your family is all that really matters in the end. And I think that we were lucky to come out of it healthy and unscathed. Um, and yeah, puts life in perspective right then and there. Pretty grounded view of it, Mariah. Yeah. Pretty grounded view. So you go out to the East Coast for school. Yep. What did you major in and what the heck brought you back here? You know, winters right? are cold here. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I went to Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont, which is a, a private liberal arts um, small college with a real focus in languages. So that was what drew me there. I knew I wanted to go to the East Coast because of my grandparents and family. And I just was excited about um, going somewhere new. Um, but Middlebury was just an idyllic, amazing place. I was so lucky to be there. Um, I had been studying French and so I continued those studies at Middlebury and majored actually majored in political science and a minor in French and then I added art history to the mix uh, when I studied abroad in Paris my junior year of college and really fell in love with with art and um, the ability to do my studies while sitting in the Louvre like that made a lot of sense so I added that and that's really where I, I can see that creative side like starting to really show up for me, you know, it always worked alongside my parents um, and my mom and we would be doing art projects and crafts and all of that. But it was like really that interest in art, I think, um, sort of to see like my design potential. And um, yeah, so that was college. And after that, I uh, stayed out east and ended up working in Washington, D.C. for a few years um, in management consulting. So uh, honestly, left political science at the door the day I graduated and went straight into uh, management 
consulting business um, and uh, just really enjoying life as a 20 something in Washington, DC. It was fantastic. No, I bet you grow up and, and I, I guess I have to now end every one of our, uh, our little conversations here with we. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about yeah. Northland special events. It's sure. 2010. And how did this all get concocted to, to start your own business? Yeah. So I'll try to, to connect these dots as quickly as possible. Um, I got married to my husband in Washington, D.C., plans a wedding, hired someone to help me at the very end, pull it all together. After the wedding, when that was a raging success, thought to myself, hmm, I really like what she did and I could actually really see myself in her shoes. Threw that out to her. She hired me um, and I started just dabbling in wedding coordination in DC uh, for a couple of years and uh, loved it. It was a, a great side gig. Flash forward, um, my husband and I were so fortunate to have identical twin daughters. They were born in DC. And immediately the day they were born, I was like, I need to go to the Midwest. Like I just had this like absolute undeniable homing mechanism that I needed to raise these kids in Minnesota and I need to be nearby my parents. So um, we started plans right away to move. I somehow talked to my New Yorker husband into moving to Minnesota. I don't know. I uh, got very lucky that he went along with it. Um, and uh, we relocated. We were in the Twin Cities for a while. And while we were there, my sister got engaged and she wanted the North Shore wedding. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll come out of my wedding retirement um, and plan your wedding in Minnesota and uh, did her wedding up at Lutzen Resort. And that's when I had an aha moment. I said, wait a minute. I could do this here, like in this amazingly beautiful, incredible place. Yes, please. And so I recognized there was also not really anybody else doing the planning design and kind of all the things that I could bring to the table. And so I decided right then and there, that was 2010, um, to throw a shingle out and see what could happen. And now, 12 years later, thousands of weddings, um, like I can hardly believe how it's all played itself out. Mariah, let's go back to the beginning. What were some of the biggest yeah. challenges when you're first forming and first starting out, you said, hang a shingle out. You yeah. probably don't have a lot of contacts at that point to, hey, I want to be a wedding planner. So when you first formed Northland Special Events, what were some of your biggest challenges? I think that the, the biggest challenge kind of then and, and even still today is the balance between working in the business and on the business. And throwing myself so wholeheartedly into the events themselves and the delivery of a, an, like an exceptional product and experience for the client. Um, but then having to go back and ask the question along the way, did I actually make any money doing this? Is this actually a business? Um, and balancing that because as you're growing, especially in those early days, it was pretty exponential growth um, for, I would say the first eight years, maybe seven, um, where I got lucky. Like I was at the right place at the right time offering something that people were realizing that they really wanted and needed. Um, and so it was, you know, 12 weddings and 35 weddings and 70 weddings. And like, it, it, it was snowballing. Um, but, you know, looking up at the end of every year and saying like, is there anything left, <laughs> you know, and kind of having to learn the business side. I know I can deliver on the product. I am so passionate about what I do. Um, but that's a true entrepreneur who loves the, their product has to figure out how to make that uh, something that turns a profit. And so my biggest challenge the entire time um, has been figuring that, uh, figuring that out and, and understanding that balance and making time to work in the business, not well, or on the business, not just in it. I know, I'd say firsthand, but I'll call it secondhand, that you put in one heck of a lot of time, because I know several years ago now, my wife was in contact with you one heck of a lot when you did a, you planned a wedding for us. But can you walk us through, for, for somebody like a dumb old guy like me, I, how do you do this? How do you start? Yeah. How do you work your way through the process to the finish line, which is wedding day and, and literally into the next day. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's about starting where the couple's at or the family's at that I'm working with and, and understanding, I try to approach it from like understanding where their needs really lie. And sometimes they might have a lot of details figured out, but what they really need is emotional support. And other times they don't have the first clue about who and what and where and when. Um, and so I try to just start by meeting them, like, where are they at in this process? What are the dynamics um, at play between the couple, between the families? Um, and then insert myself in whatever way can steer them towards success. The way I look at it is that, you know, I, planning a wedding for me is just a, a set of simple building blocks. Like we can put this together um, really easily. What gets hard is around a wedding is an emotion and and so much pressure put on an outcome. And so I try to break it down into bite-sized chunks and to manage the relationships and the emotions that flow so that by the time we get to the wedding day, they're not, my clients are not worried about the outcome. They're just ready to be present, have a good time and be excited about this major investment that they've made and the beginning of a new family and a new chapter in their lives. And so um, when I approach it that way, I think that's some of my secret sauce and the ability to just break it down and focus on what's really important here because all the behind the scenes stuff, I'm going to take care of that. That's why you've hired me. We're going to make sure that you get, you know, your dream come true at a price you, you want to pay and you still have all your relationships intact at the end. Right. How do you start that part of the conversation with yeah. a customer? Because everyone obviously has a budget and, yeah, sure. you know, some budgets are going to be minimal. Some budgets are going to be, holy cow, I just got an open checkbook. How do yeah. you manage in between that? The, yeah. I guess the, maybe the question and, and answer phase of the budget and what can I do with this? It's really like expectation setting. So what I'll, what I believe is that you can have the most memorable day on any budget. That's just not what's important in this. So if we can focus on what's important is ultimately the marriage. Um, and we can pull like distill down, like the key details that are most important to the couple, we can then take what they have to work with and build, you know, a, a day, um, an experience that is going to be incredibly memorable. And so it's almost like decoupling the expense from the desire, like what they really want, and then putting the pieces together in a way that fits. And, and after listening for a while, I can usually say like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to level your expectations. Like here's for a hundred people at this venue, like here's what's probably going to be your baseline. If that doesn't work for you, if that makes everything else uncomfortable, let's revisit your options here. So, um, but it's just listening. That's, and, and having them just tell me their story, tell it, tell me, you know, just get them talking and I'll, I can figure out a lot of it from there. So how in the heck do you deal with bridezilla, motherzilla and mother-in-law Zilla? Yeah. <laughs> There's TV shows about that. Yes, they exist. <laughs> I'm very lucky though, because in this market, maybe it's just the Minnesota nice, but in this market, we have wonderful clients. I'm so fortunate. I tell you, I hear, hear horror stories from my <laughs> colleagues around the, around the world who are wedding planners whenever I go to conventions and things. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so lucky. I really work with wonderful people. Um, but anytime I see tension in again, between relationships, like I just try to think about like what's really behind this. And I try to get them to see that too. Like whatever's happening, like, it's not about the wedding. It's about something else. So let's try to look at that and solve for that. Um, and that really helps them to like, think like asking those, again, those right questions for them to sort of say like, oh, this is about feeling included, wanting to have, you know, to be, to have an opinion considered. And I'm like, if it's no skin off your back, just listen to what your future and mother-in-law or what your bridesmaid wants from the situation and maybe making them happy is a pretty small ask. So I try to just kind of bring it down to earth and say like, there's really something else going on here. And if we can maybe work on that, it's going to just fall away from the wedding itself. So. Right. You have a, a statement that you say, and it's everything will be okay. Yeah. How did, how did you come up uh, with this? Is, is this from a, uh, 
from a from a flood of the Red River, or is this <laughs> from uh, dealing with yeah. with uh, issues at weddings, or maybe a little of both? I think it's a lot of that. You know, <laughs> honestly, it probably really stems back to like backpacking through Europe as a college student, and you know, all the different things that can go wrong, especially before cell phones existed, um, and realizing like we're gonna be fine, everything's gonna be okay. So yeah, I've really had that mentality for most of my life. I'm a very optimistic person. And I really, from a very early age, I've had a deep sense that like, there's like, there's just a, everything's meant to be like, there's just a certain amount of like predisposition here that I believe in. And I think that, um, more recently I've, I've turned to say like the universe has my back and I, you know, I believe and trust that, that this is going to work out. And so, um, it really helps as a wedding planner to have that mindset uh, because I have to get the the couples over the finish line. Like we're in it on that day for better, for worse, doesn't matter what the weather is. So I have to keep their mindset towards it's going to be okay. Um, because that's, that's my goal as, as their guide um, on that day. And the way that I've seen it work out, that's the best part is like the things that don't go as planned, they go better. Like their outcomes are even more magical, more memorable, like the number of times, like the damn rainbow has come out of the, the rainstorm and we've gotten the photos. And I mean, there's just so many things that I'm like, we couldn't have planned that, but we got like, got that because we were patient and optimistic and held, you know, held it together. So yeah. what, Mariah, what is the worst issue that you've ever faced in wedding planning, I mean, you you just mentioned there the weather and all these kind of things, and, yeah. and maybe mother-in-law Zilla or whatever. But what, you know, what's one of the yeah. worst thing you know scenarios that it's like, oh, couldn't see that coming. Um, how about a pandemic? <laughs> the, well, we'll, no, we'll, get, get, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. I, that's oh a, man, that's, that one's too easy. Come on. <laughs> I really thought I'd seen it all until then. Um. Gosh, that's such a good question. I mean, it's usually weather related, to be honest. Like, that's one that no matter what you do, you can't control it. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, I've had sick, sick bridesmaids where we're trying to get them down the aisle. I had one couple whose daughter smashed her finger in the hotel door room the morning of the wedding. So she's there at the ER, you know, and I'm trying to deal with everything to, to change the time of the ceremony. You know, it's just like, it's often like medical related or weather. Um, but yeah, I really, I, I put out some fires. I've plunged some toilets. Like, it's just one of those things, like you don't even, you don't even flinch. It's like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Gotta be done. Mariah, what's the best fix for a potential disaster that you've ever come up with? Oh my gosh. Uh, one of my tried and true, uh, and, and this seems like not a big deal, but so many brides, they have a bustle on the back of their dress. Well, that bustle, I tell you nine times out of 10 breaks while they're on the dance floor. And you've made all these investments. You've got this far on the wedding day. And then the bride can't dance. Like that sounds so like inconsequential, but it's actually incredibly irritating. So I have some patented fixes to those bustles that involve zip ties. Uh, and I can't tell you the number of times where I just come up behind them, zip tie the dress right up. And they're like, oh my God, like best thing that happened all day. So what did really you do seems, back there? Don't yeah, worry it about very it. Very small, but let me tell you the impact of just knowing, I see it out of the corner of my eye. and like, this is going south fast with that bustle. Fix her up, good to go rest of the night. So it doesn't, you know, it, it's the little things in this job that truly make all the difference in the end. Folks, we're, today we're talking with Mariah McKechnie. She's the owner of uh, Northland Special Events, The Vault, we'll get into that in a minute, and Superior Blooms, quite the entrepreneur, working with people on one of the most stressful days of their lives. You are God sent because holy cow. <laughs> Dealing with dealing with all of us in, in those days has to be sometimes uh, a nightmare, just dealing with humans. Let's now fast forward a little bit. You mentioned it there. Come on. Every person, every business has been dealt a blow yeah. in COVID. Now, 
I think most of the weddings were probably canceled in some way, shape, or form. How were you affected? Well, um, pretty majorly. And uh, it was interesting. Many of them postponed, uh, some canceled, but you'd be surprised how many just reformatted and went forward in, in different shapes and sizes. And and uh, I would say we were able to to work with 99.9% of our clients to a, a really positive outcome. And that made me, um, you know, just really proud because I was trying to keep a business afloat while also managing clients, you know, emotions and investments and, and just a time when we literally had no idea one day to the next, what was going to happen. So, um, it was, it was crazy. The, the hardest one I had during that time was, uh, August this past August where, and we're really still in the thick of the thick of it. And we had a venue where the like leading up to the wedding, the client was actually a nurse who had been so just bogged down in the pan- pandemic. Like she was in it working in the hospital and then her wedding the week before her wedding, the venue owners got COVID on the venue site, which was up the shore. And like, Oh my gosh, what we had to go through to just help her manage her fears, anxieties around the guests and everything she'd been through and the post-traumatic stress that she was going through to get through her wedding day successfully. Like that one really just showed me like how hard it, how hard it was. And that was in 21. I mean, that wasn't even what happened in 2020 and we were still battling. So, um, but somehow I, I feel so lucky that the pandemic taught me to slow down. It helped me get off the hamster wheel that I was on that I probably as an entrepreneur could have never gotten off or or would have maybe ended badly. Um, I had, I was given the gift of time and opportunity to rethink the way that I was running my business to just change a lot to downsize, get rid of stuff, you know, rethink how I did things. And I used every minute of that time as wisely as I could to reinvest in myself, my family, my business, and to really like, I don't know, cure a burnout that had been going on for quite a few years, you know, after that long 10 year push. Um, So I came out of it with a healthier business, healthier, personally, healthier family. And I'm just like, God, I'm lucky. That's all I can keep saying because so many people did not have that outcome. And, you know, I just feel really blessed that I was able to weather it like that. And, and my business is, you know, we just stuck it out one wedding at a time, one day at a time and helping our clients, like get the most that they could out of what was available to them on any given day. You know, I can tell you, Mariah is an extremely, extremely hard worker. I didn't deal with her a whole lot (laughs) prior to our daughter's wedding, but my wife did and my daughter did. And I I do remember very succinctly the wedding night. I'm in bed sleeping. It's 2.33 in the morning after everything was done. And I hear our garage door go up. And I said to my wife, I go, who's coming here? I hear the garage door going, coming up. And she goes, oh, that's Mariah. She's just dropping off all the flowers at our house. You're still working <laughs> at 2.30 in the morning. I wake up in the morning and our garage is full of flowers. Yes. So holy cow. Yeah. Mariah, tell us a little bit about the OG. I have no idea, but there's a note here for me to ask about oh. the OG. <laughs> um, you know, it's really, I, I'm the original. And when I started the business, like, I wore every hat. I'm the florist. I'm the decorator. I'm the planner. Sometimes I'm the officiant. Um, And from there, you know, I've had to spin off a lot of those roles and to get, you know, people to help me in managing those elements of the company. Um, But I, I still today tell many clients, like, I wear a lot of hats. And on your wedding day, don't be surprised to see me in all different places, um, especially when I'm officiating, because the guests are like, wait, we just saw you there and now you're over here. Like, who is this person? So, um, yeah, I'm really, you know, I like to think of myself as, as the original, uh, one woman wedding show. So, well, but you're not, no, yeah. you have a st- growing staff. I do, yeah. Can you tell us about that as you've grown and, and now you've, you know, staffed up with people that, that hopefully can take some of that burden yeah. off of oh, you. They for sure do. Yeah. So, you know, really started to recognize actually just before 2020 that 
the different roles within the, the um, company that we were offering to our clients from doing their flowers and acting as their florist to their event decor, ceiling draping, you know, kind of all of the, what does it look like role? Um, I had just had a, a, a potential of its own and I needed to structure the company to fully recognize that. And so we did some preliminary work um, in the, the fall of 2019 to envision what that would look like. And then fortunately through 2020 actually gave us the time and benefit to, um, to fully separate out those divisions. And so now Northland Special Events is event planning, wedding planning, design, and coordination. So I lead that division and I am focused on working with clients um, on their planning and their coordination. I then have the Vault Event Decor Rental, and that is a boutique specialty rental organization um, with an amazing collection of furniture um, and just interesting props and decor to you know, keep up with the trends in wedding design and outfit a space, you know, within a, a client's, um, you know, design. And then they also do ceiling draping and support clients who do it themselves with the setup side of setup and takedown side. So, um, you know, really good uh, cross section of activities within the design and, and decor side of weddings. And then we have Superior Blooms, which is our full service event specific uh, florist. And so we only do event related floral under that brand. So um, each of them has their own manager and their own contracts and clients. And it's been so cool to see them thrive individually. And then when we all get to come together as a team and work on a project, it's so exciting. Um, and the client benefits from, you know, just the synergies of us sharing space and sharing, you know, one leader at the top. How many, how many staff members do you have now? So during our busy season, um, we'll be somewhere in the 30s, um, but across all three divisions. Um, at, just before the pandemic, that summer of 2019, we had upwards of 50, um, but we've streamlined a little bit and kind of, you know, re rethought some positions. So, um, but I, I will easily be pushing 30, um, 35 probably this summer. And then we'll scale back um, seasonally in November um, to just a core team over the winter. Do you have a couple of twin daughters that are uh, on the staff here this summer helping mom? Out? Yes. So I'm so lucky. Um, my, my daughters have grown up in this business from the earliest age um, that, that they can remember. They've been in the wedding world. And so this past summer, they started working on the team. Um, they're actually on the vault uh, setup team. And uh, it's been absolutely so cool to see them thrive and also for them to appreciate what I go through when they're doing those 3 a.m. teardowns, uh, they really have a feel for their mom when they understand better why I'm so tired uh, on Sunday morning. So um, I think that like actually did a lot for just uh, appreciation of all the effort that I've put in. So Mariah, you're talking about the vault. Yep. So we, we've talked about Northland special events, which which is, is not only weddings, but also special mm -hmm. event planning and from from, Literally, I'll call it soup to nuts, but A to Z, it, folks, if, if you if you want an expert that's going to help you and take so much of that stress off you, uh, you, you, you owe it to yourself to give Mariah and her team a call because they will take that, that uh, stress off of you. But let's talk a little more about the yeah. vault. You said you have a lot of props and different things. So, so your clients can rent these props, whether it's a wedding or any special event that's going on so that they don't have to go look out and buy or go chase things around and try to figure it out on their own that and what kind of props are we talking about just give me give us some ideas yeah so um a really big trend in events uh is lounge furniture so setting up casual seating spaces for your guests who maybe don't want to be on the dance floor but don't want to sit at a table so we'll do curated lounges of you know vintage furniture or boho furniture or mid-century modern we have a, a collection kind of spanning all the different styles of um, armchairs and sofas and coffee tables and rugs and you know can create these little worlds within the venues um, so that's been our a huge expansion over the last two years is that inventory and then we also have backdrops photo backdrops backdrops behind head tables um, you know 
just lots of different uh, things that we can hang and drape and, and create atmosphere. It's all about creating atmosphere. Um, and then down to some of the smaller tabletop things, centerpieces, um, signage, and things that just like you don't need to own, but you want to have for one day. And we try to, again, keep up with the trends and watch what's happening on the coasts um, as far as wedding design, I, usually a few years behind to get to Duluth. Um, but we're hopefully on the forefront of bringing those items and, and having them available for rentals. Um, so, Mariah, what, one question is, um, so can customers go on the website for the mm -hmm. vault and look at what their options yep. are before they even talk to you about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and we love when they do because they can go right to the inventory gallery on the website and create a wish list. And so actually just earlier today I had had a client sent them the website inventory gallery they went on, created the wish list that emailed to us. And we already going into our consultation with them could formulate ideas and options and questions and really bring um, you know so much more to the table because we were starting from what they were interested in. Um, and, and the other thing that I always tell people is follow our Instagram because everything makes it to the website eventually. But if you wanna see it like fresh in the inventory, we're highlighting it on our Instagram stories or Instagram feed. Um, that's really fun because we are finding new treasures all the time and adding them to our vaults. So give us all of your handles yeah. since we're talking yeah. about Instagram for, for, for all three companies. We really haven't hit on Superior Bloom a whole yep. lot yet, but we'll get there. Give us your handles so people can go see the Instagram and the websites and do all of this ahead yeah, of time. Yeah, so um, Northland Special Events is exactly, that's our website. Um, NSC Weddings is our Instagram handle at NSC Weddings. And then um, the Vault Duluth is the website um, for the Vault. and. Uh, and the same for Instagram handle, it's the Vault Duluth. And then Superior Blooms, um, it's Superior Blooms Duluth is the website. And then just Superior Blooms on Instagram. Um, and all three of them, you know, cross feature all of our work all of the time. And on the, you know, planning side, weddings are for sure, you know, the, the key thing that we do. But I also work with a lot of corporate and nonprofit clients to plan their um, holiday parties, galas meetings, um, you know, a lot of different work. And, and I, I love doing that too. It's, it's a totally different um, type of planning, um, but it's fun because I often have repeat clients where we get to reinvent, you know, an annual event every year and make it special and focus on employee appreciation and, you know, different objectives within the company. So I love, I love working on those, those events as well. And folks, if you go on Northland special events, they're actually all three yeah. linked together. So you can go on one and you can see them all because I did it yeah, and it worked really I'm easy. If I, can, if, I, if I can make it work, I'll promise you anybody can make it work. Well, as the uh, corporate well, web designer, I'm happy to hear that all my links worked because I take care of all that back end too. <laughs> Well, they did what I was oh. using it. So I, I and I, I don't think I broke good, them. Good. Uh, uh, Superior Blooms. Yep. Tell us about that. What was the, you know, the mindset behind that? And, you know, if, if Northland Special Events and the vault's not enough, we might as well add another flowers. one. Well, so, so all three truly link back to my sister's wedding, that seminal event in 2010, when I, I can just remember saying to my mom, like, hey, we're going to do the wedding. I'm going to find all the decor. And guess what? I think we should teach ourselves how to be florists. And I'm so lucky because my mom is the biggest supporter of all of my dreams. And she was like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm down. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so from that day and that wedding, we taught ourselves floristry. Um, and, and even stemming further back, I did not love my own wedding flowers. And so I kind of had in the back of my head, like if I get a redo on this, I'm doing it myself. Um, and so that was my chance. We did her flowers. She loved them. And I kind of just decided like, I want to incorporate this. I love the creative design aspect. Um, so slowly, but surely we taught ourselves the ins and outs of of wedding floristry. Uh, and, and I, I still today, I, I step in and do a lot of it when I, when I can in the floral studio with Superior Blooms. Um, cause it's just absolutely like an amazing creative outlet and every, nearly every wedding has flowers. And so it's a really great to be able to link that, um, all the design components together through one connected company. Uh, so as a planner, I, I, if I have a visual in my head of what this client's asking for, I know I can make that happen through their decor and their floral as well. 
Do, do you use Superior Blooms then? I mean, is, is it only working with your other companies or do you work with other events companies who don't have a yeah. florist or other events period that need uh, a florist? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. It is not exclusive at all to NSC or the vault clients. It is a totally branded and available on its own to anyone with interest in event floral. Uh, we have dabbled in retail floral as well, but we're currently just, you know, really focused on specializing in, in events. Um, but yeah, you can go straight to the website and book an appointment with our um, lead designer, Desi. And uh, it's, you know, really it's just wedding floral in general. Um, we're happy to, happy to help. Okay, the dumb question. Do you own your own big uh, greenhouse? <laughs> I mean, how are you doing? How are you pulling all yeah. this off? No, that's so funny that you ask that. So uh, we're very lucky. We have a wholesale floral uh, distributor in Minneapolis called Kohler and Dram. And they're one of the best in the country. They're incredible. And we are very close by. So um, we get weekly floral deliveries, usually three times a week from them. Um, we also work with a few other online um, wholesalers. So everything comes delivered to us. Um, and we, and we go from there and most florists have a lot of cooler space. Um, and we somehow have made do for 12 years with very little cooler space, although that is about to change. So I'm very excited to, to finally have a walk-in cooler, um, in our, in our future. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting dealing with a living dying product and all of the, you know, hilarity that can ensue and trying to keep that alive. But, uh, yeah, th there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories there. So you're doing a wedding. Uh, I'm just envisioning here. You're doing a wedding, Mariah, in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. We are in northern Minnesota. And this winter, the winter that would never end, <laughs> okay. uh, this last winter. Uh, and it's 35 below zero and the wind is blowing. And I know that uh, floral doesn't like that so much. So how do you handle transporting getting from A to B without destroying everything before it gets to point C. Yeah, uh, very carefully, a uh, lot of plastic <laughs> bags over everything, uh, you know, get pull up as close as possible to the door. Um, but flowers are surprisingly res resilient. Um, and But my biggest thing, if I know a bride has, or a couple has a winter wedding and they're going to take outdoor photos, I recommend creating a bouquet that we can you can be used for the outdoor photos that is going to be resilient to weather, such as something with greenery, evergreen, um, or even faux or like pine cones, you know, something like that, so that the the floral bouquet doesn't have to be outside for a prolonged period of time. So um, I usually try to encourage them to to have a second bouquet that can be used in those photos um, because that uh that does not pretty when those come back inside. So. Mariah, during COVID for Superior Blooms, how did supply chain, Yeah, was that upset for you? Because it seems like, you know, just about anything. And I guess I've never thought of flowers before. Was that upset? Yeah. And what has happened with the current prices of everything going up with floral? This year. Yeah, so definitely experienced supply chain issues, just like every other industry. Um, the nice thing about our floral and working with our clients is that, you know, we're, we're always looking for substitute, a substitution list and being creative about how we can achieve a look using whatever's available. Um, so it is something where people generally do know that availability changes. Um, you know, we're, we're used to, you know, bad storms in Ecuador or something happening in the rose growing regions of the world can have reverberations here, you know, months later. And that was happening before the pandemic. So, um, so we're used to that. We're used to substitutions, uh, pricing. Yeah. That's, that's inflation, just like everything else we're dealing with right now. So it's kind of monitoring weekly, like where are we at and, and what can we do to offset this price increases on contracts that we wrote 12 months ago? you know, that's a challenging thing in the wedding industry is you're delivering work on prices and contracts that were agreed upon 12 months or longer ago. And that's kind of been a learning curve for me in business as, as inflation has happened. And I've had to realize like, Hmm, it's going to cost me a lot more to deliver this work this year than I could have possibly anticipated. So, um, yeah, just kind of figuring out how to, to either in whatever way we can, um, 
manage expenses or in some ways go back to the client and, and renegotiate um, if, if, if we need to, hoping. That, that was a question of, of mine is, you know, in some of, you know, the contracts in, in our manufacturing that we do in our companies, um, you know, a lot of the bigger quotes will have timeframes yeah. on them that, you know, this quotes, this quote is good for the next 30 yeah. days, 45, 90 days, whatever. And, and are you doing that? And, or yeah. will you need to do that in the future? You know, we haven't had to, but I can't say that we won't have to consider it. Um, you know, it's, it's impossible to ever predict the future. Um, but I've had to look at, uh, you know, how, how far out we, we commit and, um, what kind of contractual clauses that we can put in place that give us a little bit of wiggle room? Um, because I'm I'm an incredibly generous person and and can be to a fault. And like I said, what's my hardest thing in business? Keeping that profit flowing. So you know, having to, right. having to look at that bottom line because you know I just get I, I just am a giver. I'm like, never mind, don't worry about it. But uh, that doesn't so much work for the for the big picture in the business. No, it's okay to say you're a for-profit business. <laughs> it's That's not, not a bad. Struggle. That's not. How else do you buy your brand new cooler? I know, you buy right? Brand new I cooler need the cooler. Yeah. Ex- yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask a question. I hear uh, in in your business, and so let's just talk the wedding business right now. Is you know photographers that they'll they'll go. Yeah, I was just in Hawaii. I I, I got hired by a family and they had the wedding in Hawaii. They, they shipped me over yeah. there and and I did their wedding. Mariah, are you are you going to Hawaii <laughs> most of the winter doing really cool weddings? You know, Tom, I'm really not. And here's why. Uh, I definitely started early in my career thinking, oh, I'm going to travel all over and do weddings. And and there are people that do that and love that. Um, but what I've come to love is the deep knowledge that I have of my area in my specialty location. So I also recognize in, in working with couples, how important my roots here are to their outcomes. And so if I have someone who it wants to get married in a different city, I will help them find a planner in that city because they are going to better serve their end needs. And I hope the same that somebody coming to Duluth or this region, the Northland is looking for somebody located here because the knowledge that they have of the behind the scenes and the relationships is far going to outweigh in my mind, what I can do going into a new market. Let me tell you, trying to break into the Hawaii wedding market the local vendors will eat you alive. So um, I just not what I, I'm interested in really <laughs> like focusing on North shore weddings, Duluth weddings, where I am an expert. And then I'll go to Hawaii on vacation in the winter and enjoy it and not have to work there. So that's what I've put together as, as my game plan. Perfect. Well, you know, I was trying to get I you know, to Hawaii. I here. I'm doing my job. I'll take, I'll take the vacation all day long over the, the over the hustle. <laughs> it's hot in Hawaii. So Mariah, we're going to pivot a little bit here and we're going to go into what we call our packed questions segment. So we're going to go and, and ask some personal questions about Sounds you. Good. Let's do it. So, I'm book. Yeah. So what is, we, we just talked about Hawaii. <laughs> What's your favorite vacation destination? Well, I, you may learn from a lot of your clients too that this was an awesome place to go on a honeymoon. Yeah. I mean, I love to travel. Honestly, every chance that I get or we get as a family, we are we are traveling. And um, you know, that just there are just so many places in the world. But if I have to choose, um, I 100% love a Caribbean beach. Give me the Bahamas. I love to snorkel. I think those, like those blue waters, just growing up in North Dakota, like I thought, I didn't know that I believed it existed until I saw it in real life. And I remember my first Caribbean cruise and I was like, oh my God, it's real. Turquoise waters are real. So that gets me every time. Um, But I got to say, I'm also, you know, send me to Paris any day. Like I speak the language. I lived there for a year. I love everything about that place. So um, I'm going in June of this year and I'm very excited to get back there. So. We, oui. oui. that's it. That's all I have. Uh, what, if, what, Mariah, what really inspires you right now? What really just lights your fire? I'm so incredibly inspired by my daughters and, and their generation. 
I every day am, am just amazed by how affirming they are, how the, the, the culture, the youth culture today is just so loving and accepting. Um, I just am so impressed with their technological prowess. I mean, I bring my computer home and they fix it now. So that's awesome. Um, and they're just so dang smart and challenge me and inspire me. So, you know, I, I just, I, I look to them as a, as a future and, and it looks bright. Um, when I see, when I see, you know, what they're learning and what they have to offer. Well, you know, that's, that's so good to hear from a mother that they, that you see the future being bright and, and it's inspiring because we hear so many bad things about these next generations to hear somebody who just finds yeah. that inspiring is, is pretty great. Mariah, what's the best piece of life advice that you have ever received? Yeah. So I have been very lucky to have a lot of coaching um, and, you know, business coaching over the years and a, a coach of mine a few years back, she just really explained to me that whatever decisions I made or, or whatever direction I went, I needed to approach it with joy and ease. And I'll just remember her talking to me about just like trusting the process and to approach it with joy and ease. And I find so often whenever I'm at a, you know, a fork in the road or I'm trying to make decisions, like I just focus on what's going to bring me joy and where do I feel ease? I'm not getting pushback. It just feels natural. I, I, you know, I'm excited about it. And I think that has really helped ground me um, in business when you are faced with so many hard decisions. Um, it's just to keep into perspective, like open the door where joy and ease lies behind it and then see all your, you know, everything fall into place. And I use that with my clients in wedding planning all the time where I say, if you're running up against something that feels hard, I want you to step back and I want you to focus on like, what would bring you joy and what is flowing with ease. And when you do that, the right thing will show up on your doorstep and fall into place. And it's just the coolest to watch that happen. So I've really adopted that mentality into the way that I, I live every day and, and run my business. I think of a lot of us could, could learn from that. And I know you do bring that onto your clients because my family was a client of yours and heck, I thought everything just it happened. Just happens. That was just, it looks uh, easy. It, I thought, you know what? For all the listeners out there, you want to deal with Mariah, <laughs> whether it's a special event or whether it's a wedding, because it just happens and it happens perfectly, just the way it should happen. She makes our lives easy. And this is from a client who would definitely hire you in a minute again. Well, not me, my wife. <laughs> right? you, made my, you made my wife's life at a very, very good for that time period. Uh, Mariah, what's your best favorite, I guess your favorite form of self-care for you? You have a very stressful job dealing with people that are in a stressful time of their life. How do you take care of yourself? I have, um, I've instituted a monthly massage appointment. That has uh, really been something that I've just said, I'm, I'm doing this for myself. This is my time to take care of my body and I have an amazing um, masseuse that I just feel like that's, that's, that's my, me time. Um, and then I got to say, I'm, I, I like a little bit of retail therapy at home goods. Like if, if I just need to clear my head, I'm going to get a cart and wander around home goods and I'm probably not going to buy anything, but I'm just going to feel better when I leave. So, um, those are, yeah, full, full disclosure. That's where you, that's where you can find me on a Sunday after a wedding. You could, you, you could buy some really cool things for the vault. I do find that often. I, yeah, I usually do have something in my cart, but, uh, yeah, I, I like to shop I like a little bit of retail therapy. That is awesome. And, and we thank you so much for being here. Our special guest today has been Mariah McKechnie. She is the owner of Northland Special Events, The Vault, and Superior Bloom. Mariah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. And I just, I love being able to continue working with clients and interacting. And it's, it's just one of the really beautiful things about my job is, is the connections that I get to make. Well, you do one heck of a job of it. Thank you. And folks, until next time, unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors.
Cheers.